This presentation highlights John Buchan's involvement with the First Nations of Canada during his time as Governor General from 1935 until 1940. JB's appointment as Governor General came at a time when the attitudes to the British monarchy and their involvement in Canadian life were not strong. The political arena was developing into forging a newer and more modern Canada. Buchan's appointment was seen as choosing a writer rather than a statesman, but over the years he succeeded in the latter too. His term of office included the abdication crisis, a royal visit of King George VI, and the declaration of war bringing Canada into World War II. One of his achievements was to spend time visiting the length and breadth of Canada to understand the different peoples and cultures which made up the country. He reminded Canadians of their rich history, natural beauty, and most of all, their future opportunities for the country. He believed that a modern and stronger Canada would emerge if all its people came together to develop it. This included the First Nation peoples, the Inuit in the north, prairie farmers, Western settlers, new immigrants and French Canadians. In understanding the background to the First Nations situation by the mid 20th century, let's review the history. In Canada, the indigenous peoples were from many distinct nations and couldn't be classified as simply native. There were the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Squamish, and perhaps the most infamous, the Iroquois nation. During the European fight for control of Canada, the Iroquois had allied themselves with the French, with many bloody wars and conflicts. A large part of French Louisiana had also been ceded to the British. As settlers moved west, as in the US, there were conflicts with indigenous peoples. However, the British approach to empire, especially under Queen Victoria, was perhaps slightly different, with less hostility but the fact remained that settlers and railroads continued to infringe on native lands with loss of buffalo herds, deforestation of the natural habitat, and of course, settlement. A series of treaties were signed over the years with treaty number six being a significant one. Queen Victoria was seen as the mother figure of the empire, reassuring the native people about her protection. But the various treaties were possibly forced upon them due to hunger, smallpox and settler encroachments. But the government approach was to assist, not to humiliate, for example, guaranteeing medical help and food in return for ceding the lands. The bone of contention later, however, running into JB's day, was the fact that many of the nations thought they were loaning the land, as in their view, it wasn't theirs anyway, no one owned it and the medical help provided was often poor, just a medicine chest, not improved long-term health care. Throughout his time as Governor General, JB developed his relationship with the Indigenous peoples. He spent time in the Northwest Territories, for example, visiting the Inuit. He enjoyed the travel, the adventure, and visiting the wilderness areas. His son Johnny, later the second Lord Tweedsmere, also worked with the Hudson Bay Company and JB visited him. His official visits were of course highly organised, but JB was keen to ensure a balance of meeting dignitaries with real people, new settlers, the farmers, First Nation groups. These also gave him some wonderful background pieces and storylines for his Canadian writings, including the novels of Sick Heart River and the Long Traverse. He was able to give his feedback to the government in the provinces and in Ottawa on various issues. But as the King's representative, he could only advise, not interfere. So perhaps not a lot was done. As JB developed his relationship with various First Nation peoples, he received many official honours from them. This was not only because he was the highest representative of the King and the Empire in Canada, but due to his fame as a writer. One of the most publicised honours was being given the title Chief Teller of Tales in August 1936 at Carlton in Saskatchewan on the anniversary of the signing of Treaty No. 6. 
Other ceremonies saw him receive honours as Chitam Squamash, or Chief of the Big Mountain, and by the Huron near Quebec City as the Scribe. In Western Canada too, the Blood Tribe of the Blackfoot Nation of Southern Alberta named him Chief Eaglehead, and the event was witnessed by 5,000 spectators. Part of JP's speech was also in the Cree language. The museum in Peebles displays some of the items from this particular event, but it is intriguing that we cannot seem to track down the whereabouts of any other items from the over 30 honorary presentations made to JB. Maybe one day. One of his contacts was with a personality called Grey Owl, who was a First Nation campaigner for the natural environment and the improved treatment of the native peoples. He achieved a lot in the political circles, lobbying provinces and government departments. He was married to a Mohawk Iroquois and rose to prominence as a notable author and lecturer, primarily on environmental issues and working with the national parks. JB met him and admired his writings on wildlife and conservation and was pictured at his lodge, which raised his profile further. However, when Grey Owl died, it turned out that actually he was an Englishman born as Archibald Bellamy in Hastings. A hoaxer may be, but nevertheless, he worked tirelessly for the protection of the natural environment and for the native peoples who lived in these areas. One of the reasons for producing this presentation is that some of the honours bestowed on JB have found their way to the John Buchan Story Museum here in Peebles, Scotland. One special item, a magnificent eagle feather headdress, is on loan to us from the Russell Coates Museum in Bournemouth, but sadly will need to be returned at the start of 2021. Other items have been loaned by the family, so are on more permanent display as part of our Canada exhibition. And this particular headdress was presented to JB in 1936, when he was installed as Chief Eagle Head by the Blackfoot tribe of Alberta. The head person with the wonderful name of Chief shot on both sides is pictured here. The matching cape and gloves are also on display, having been restored by the generosity of members of the Buchan family. All these items are made of deerskin with some lovely beadwork and silk decoration. On the cape, the arrowhead hole can be seen on a deer skin, very neatly sewn up. Other items in the museum archive include a very large photograph album of JB's trip to the Northwest, a moose skin map of Canada, and a variety of books, letters and memorabilia of his trips around the country. So what were the real benefits of JB's contacts with the First Nations and the Inuit? He was obviously fulfilling his role as Governor General, which was to provide a sounding board and a bridge between the people and government. So understanding their issues and giving feedback to the powers that be was a key outcome. He certainly highlighted the plight of the First Nations to government, such as health, living conditions, treaty violations and status issues. But sadly, these weren't the priority of government at that time. The press usually treated these events as a photo call and as entertainment rather than political news, so the problems and issues were not discussed, and we have not uncovered much real reporting of any of the visits or honouring occasions. A visit to the Northwest Territories did capture the public imagination, however. From the perspective of the Indigenous peoples, maybe they felt that someone was going to help them by highlighting their issues and reaffirming the treaty obligations. With JB's literary success, they maybe had a champion in the teller of tales. But cynically, the Governor General visits and role merely reaffirmed imperial rule, not equality, and the drive was really to promote settlement and harvest Canada's rich resources, all would impact on these people. JB's literature after his death did help highlight to Canadians about their heritage and responsibility to the First Nations, 
with the publication of his powerful novels in 1941, Sick Heart River and The Long Traverse. Sick Heart River is an outdoors tale full of long hikes, mountaineering, hunting and tracking in winter in the extreme north. Despite periodic bouts of illness, John Buchan himself was an avid and lifelong outdoorsman and a particularly seasoned mountaineer. His hero in the story, Edward Leithen, has the same idea of the strenuous life, but now with death approaching, he must hike and climb and hunt with a body steadily decaying through time and sickness. And yet Leithen's reaction to this is neither self-pity nor rest and ease. Along the way, he comes into contact with various First Nation peoples, seeing their own suffering and helping them where he can. Buchan paints a vivid picture of their lives, culture and issues. The fictional Sick Heart River is in the real region of the Nahani River in Canada's Northwest Territories. The area was only just being mapped when Buchan, as Governor General, passed nearby during his voyage down the Mackenzie River in the summer of 1937. The Long Traverse is an adventure novel which tells the story of Donald, a boy spending his summer holidays in the Canadian countryside. John Buchan knew that some Indigenous people were said to have the power of projecting happenings of long ago onto a piece of calm water. In this tale, he chooses Nagog as Donald's companion and guide. Nagog conjures up a strange mist from a magic fire and brings to life visions from the past. And through these boyish adventures, people with Vikings, gold prospectors, Indians and Eskimos, Donald learns more about history than the school has taught him. The book was designed to assist the new generation of Canadians understand their past and so help to develop their future. And it is the future that JB was looking to in many of his activities and actions as Governor General, helping Canada to become part of the modern world, yet recognising its rich cultural and historic past. He believed that a uniquely Canadian identity could be forged through the recognition and celebration of each citizen's ethnic origins. Furthermore, the varied landscape itself, the forests and prairie, the Northern Territory, the lakes, seas and rivers, showed the potential for the development of the vast natural resources of the country. He envisaged a strong and united Canada, a mature nation on the international stage. The development of the abundant natural resources would help drive the economy forward. In his role as Governor General, JB helped to educate the rest of Empire about Canada, as well as educate Canada about their role in the world. The writer and the statesman achieved a lot in his short time in Canada, and his involvement with the First Nations was important. Chief of the Big Mountain indeed. <laughs>